support prices, and therefore farmers were quietly rejiggered to increase production and drive down prices. Put another way, instead of supporting farmers, during the Nixon administration, the government began supporting corn at the expense of farmers. Corn, already the recipient of a biological subsidy in the form of synthetic nitrogen, would now receive an economic subsidy too, ensuring its final triumph over the land and the food system. Naylor's perspective on farm policy was shaped by a story his dad used to tell. It takes place during the winter of 1933, at the depths of the farm depression. That's when my father hauled corn to town and found out that the price of corn had been 10 cents a bushel the day before. But on that day, the elevator wasn't even buying. The price of corn had fallen to zero. Tears always came to his eyes when he recounted the neighbors losing their farms in the 1920s and 30s, they were told me. America's farm policy was forged during the Depression not, as many people seem to think, to encourage farmers to produce more food for a hungry nation, but to rescue farmers from the disastrous effects of growing too much food, far more than Americans could afford to buy. For as long as people have been farming, fat years have posed almost as stiff a challenge as lean, since crop surpluses collapsed prices and bankrupt farmers who will be needed again when the inevitable lean years return. Instead of dumping corn onto a weak market, thereby weakening it further, the farmer could take out a loan from the government, using his crop as collateral that allowed him to store his grain until prices recovered. At that point, he sold the corn and paid back the loan. If corn prices stayed low, he could elect to keep the money he'd borrowed and, in repayment, give the government his corn, which would then go into something that came to be called, rather quaintly, the ever-normal granary. Other New Deal programs, such as those administered by the Soil Conservation Service, sought to avert overproduction and soil erosion by encouraging farmers to idle their most environmentally sensitive land. The system, which remained in place more or less until shortly before George Naylor came back to the farm in the 1970s, did a fairly good job of keeping corn prices from collapsing in the face of the 20th century's rapid gains of yield. Surpluses were held off the market by the offer of these non-recourse loans, which cost the government relatively little, since most of the loans were eventually repaid. And when prices climbed, as a result of bad weather, say, the government sold corn from its granary, which helped both to pay for the farm programs and smooth out the inevitable swings in price. America's farmers had long been making political trouble for Wall Street and Washington. In the words of historian Walter Karp, since the Civil War at least, the most unruly, the most independent, the most Republican of American citizens have been the small farmers. Beginning with the populist revolt of the 1890s, farmers had made common cause with the labor movement, working together to check the power of corporations. Rising agricultural productivity handed a golden opportunity to the farmers' traditional adversaries. Since a smaller number of farmers could now feed America, the moment had come to rationalize agriculture by letting the market force prices down and farmers off the land. So Wall Street and Washington sought changes in farm policies that would loose a plague of cheap corn.